here I am now. This is my life. This is where I am. What does God want me to do right now? Well, right now, he wants me to answer as well as I can and as briefly as I can. <laughs> so I should try to do that. Your task is to listen politely. And if you disagree, to say so gently. Right? In other words, at any given moment, and so we never, we try not to let our mind run all over the place. Should I quit my job and move to Guatemala or something, you know? No. And, and here I think St. Benedict probably said it the best. He said, Ajay, quote, Ajis, do what you're doing. If you're married, try to be married in a holy way. If you're not, don't look for it. Try to live your life. If you if you're, uh, have a job, try to do it to the glory of God. If you're sick, try to consecrate your suffering. Uh, you know, in other words, deal with the life that's actually in front of you on a daily basis. And then if you do that, God will move you. If he wants you to go to Alaska, you'll go. I mean, if he wants you to become the new patriarch of Alexandria, that'll happen too. But it can't happen unless you secure the present moment. And you can't do everything. And we're not supposed to do everything. So um, I think that that's, uh, that's uh, uh, probably the best answer. The best answer is, where are you now? What are you doing now? Try to do it to the glory of God. Try not to lie in any way, especially to yourself. Try not to figure things out, jump here and there. Don't look for an easy solution. Don't expect some clairvoyant elder to come and tell you what to do, because even then you can doubt him. Um, I think it's better just very like a child. Jesus said, unless you turn and become as a child, you never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, as a child, you depend on God and the people around you every moment, and you just try to consecrate the life that you have. And if you have an opportunity to do something, you test it, and if you think it's good, you do it, and if you don't, you say, I can't, and you don't get bent all out of shape because of it. <laughs> In fact, St. Anthony the Great was asked uh, this question, and he said, whoever you are, keep God always before your eyes. Whatever you do, do according to the scripture. And wherever you are, don't leave that place easily. Blossom where you're planted. Live, do what you're doing. Then Pambo said, what about me? He said, as for you, don't trust in your own righteousness. Don't worry about the past. It's over. And watch your mouth and your stomach. So, no, it's, it's really quite simple when you, when you get right down to it. You know, do what you're doing in the life that you actually have. And try not to sin in the smallest way. I think that's it. Yes. Because we have been bad. If that's the definition of punishment, God doesn't punish anyone ever. <laughs> and Jesus didn't die on the cross to pay the amount of punishment that we ought to get because we're sinners. That's a gross, unacceptable doctrine of redemption that is not orthodox. <laughs> There's no punishment in that sense. But there is... You know, you can say this is a little bit nuanced, and it is. But there is what the prayers and the Bible calls chastening, chastisement. God chastens those whom he loves, it even says in the scripture. I had a guy in one of my Bible studies who said, I wish he'd love someone else for a while. <laughs> um, um, but if you take the images of love in the Bible, they're pretty, they're pretty brutal. I went through them in the talk. Beating the kids, chastening the children, Hebrews, letter to the Hebrews, and the Old Testament, Proverbs. Pruning the vines by cutting, John 14. The vine, he's the vine keeper, and we're the vine, and we have to bring fruit, and when we don't bring fruit, he cuts us, right? That's painful to be cut. Burning the gold. As a, as a jeweler, to burn out the impurities. That's also painful. Smashing the vessels. <laughs> Yesterday I spoke on the phone with Father Paul Laser, 
at St. Vladimir Seminary, who's much, much better, by the way, much better. He's back to full-time work, as a matter of fact, almost. But he had orientation, and I said, did you give him the smashing the vessel talk again? And he said, yeah, I did. Because we used to tell the students who came to the seminary, you don't know, but you came here to be cut, burned, beaten, and smashed. And if you're not, it ain't working right. Because in Jeremiah, God takes the vessels that are dirty and leaky and he smashes them and refashions them with his hands. St. Irenaeus said his hands are his word and his spirit. He forms us. The word of God in the Bible is called a sword, a two-edged sword that cuts to the bones and the marrow. So, so when you go to church, you go to church to be beaten, pruned, lacerated, purified, you know. And if you think it's fun, just try to do it every day like the nuns do. <laughs> um, it's fun when you go on Saturday on a nice day for a half an hour. But if you stay there long enough, man, it gets painful. So there is a chastening, definitely. But there's no punitive retribution. God doesn't punish us like to get what's coming so that if we can get punished enough, he can let us off. Well, if you sinned against God, you could never get punished enough. But I think the gospel teaches us that God is not interested in punishment anyway. He's interested in purifying us, cleansing us, washing us, scrubbing us, and that hurts. So I don't think there's any punishment. So if God, if you look at it that way, when evil befalls the city, the prophets like Amos, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea, I mean the whole bunch of them, they would all say God is acting to make us repent, to make us change, to overcome our sin and all that kind of thing. So yeah, in that sense you could say it's a chastening, chastising act. Yeah, definitely. Father, I always explain it this way, but keep in mind that I could be wrong on all of this stuff. It's up to you to decide. <laughs> but we always, I always explained it when I taught dogmatics <clears throat> that the so-called priestly model of the atonement, that Christ dies for our sins, he buys us back, he ransoms us, he pays the price. Uh, it's not punishment. What it is, is that Jesus has to give God what we owe him. That's what the word debt means. If you have a debt, you've got to pay what you owe. Well, some people think that we owe God punishment because we were bad. So if you pay up enough punishment, he'll let you off. And then there were theories that even prayers and stuff could reduce the punishment. And there was a whole system of that in the Latin church that Luther went against. Like, for example, we had the panihida, right? Well, in some views, they would say, well, if you have a panihida, a memorial prayer, God lets off 100 days of punishment. <laughs> if you have two of them, he lets off 200 days. Well, if you only owe 600, have three more and you're off. That's not our teaching. There are no indulgences, and there's no days of temporal punishment due to sin, and we don't owe any punishment at all. And even if we could, we couldn't pay it. That's Anselm's point. That's why he had to send the Son of God. So if it needs to be paid at all, if there is punishment, then Christ pays it. But I think you've got to say there ain't any punishment. But, so what, this, what is he doing there then? I think the scriptural teaching is what he is doing is giving his life completely and totally to the will of God. He is obeying God perfectly. He is loving God perfectly. And so when you finally have a man who gives God what he owes, St. Paul, for example, said, let us, we owe nothing but to keep the commandment and all the commandment is fulfilled in love. That's what we owe, but we don't do it. So he comes and fulfills the commandments. He fulfills all righteousness. He makes everything right. Now the problem is, if you love God in this world and are completely obedient to Him and you don't overcome evil by evil, even if you're not the Son of God, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. So for Jesus to do 
to owe, give God what we owe Him, namely perfect righteousness, perfect love, perfect obedience, because we are a sinful, broken, corrupted world that required that He die. Because no greater love has anyone than He gives their life for the neighbor. So I think the debt is the debt of love, not the debt of punishment. <laughs> so when He dies, everything becomes right. Everything is set right. It's not set right because God's justice is done because we got punished enough. It sets things right because everything is made right by His righteousness. So as St. Paul said, if everything got all screwed up through the sin of one man, through the righteousness of one man, everything could be made right. But there ain't no man to make it right. So God sends His Son to be that man. <laughs> I think that's the way we would approach it. So there is a debt to be paid. And without the blood of Christ, we would be lost. And his blood does buy us back and it does redeem us. <laughs> That's for sure. That's the teaching of the Bible. But not because of punishment. I, I think that the New Testament says anyone who tries to do good will suffer. That's just the law. St. Paul says, I find it to be a law. When I try to do good, evil lies close at hand. But it's also a Christian teaching always to keep in mind that suffering in and of itself doesn't necessarily prove righteousness. The terrorists who took the building down, they gave their life. And here, by the way, excuse me for saying this, but President Bush doesn't always use the right word. He called them cowards. Well, they may be evil and everything, but they certainly weren't cowards. <laughs> to get in that plane and drive it into the building and know that you were going to die, you got to have some kind of crazy courage. <laughs> it's not cowardly, <laughs> you know. Um, but in any case, um, uh, people can die for lots of stuff. But there's two things that make a Christian martyr or confessor. One is that they die for what is right. And the second thing is they die not doing evil in return. That's extremely important. They forgive the people who killed them. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Stephen said, Lord, hold not this sin to their charge. One of the important elements of Christian martyria is the love and forgiveness that the victim has for the persecutor. And sometimes we forget this. And sometimes even our church services could be a little bit misleading, you know, as we say, you know, Diocletian, he's going to get it later, man, you know. But that wouldn't be the attitude of the, of the martyr themselves. They, you know, uh, Jesus says, and St. Paul and all, don't, o don't be overcome by evil, overcome evil by good. So it depends, martyrdom in and of itself, dying for a cause, doesn't necessarily make you righteous. If your cause is unrighteous. And here, probably the most violent sentence on this point would be in uh, St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians where he says um, about love, the great hymn to love, the 13th chapter. Everybody should uh, know this by heart. Um, but I'll look it up. Um, it says, um, not only if I have the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I'm a noisy gong and so on. But if I have prophetic powers, understand all mysteries, if I have all faith even to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but not have love, I gain nothing. And St. Cyprian of Carthage claimed that a Christian could even die for the Christian faith, but they have no real love in their heart. God is not in them. They're dying, hating the person killed. Then they die in vain. It doesn't save them. <laughs> it doesn't save them. So. Yep. Virginia. Oh. Well, I used to kind of joke. The question is the three things. Virginia listens to tapes, so she knows I quote my mother, you know. 
I used to quote my mother so much at the seminary that there were a group of students who used to call her Tamotokos. <laughs> um, 